Good evening, my name is Seho and I am a member of the TIFF Next Wave Committee, a group of 12 young film lovers responsible for programming the TIFF Next Wave Film Festival that takes place in February, as well as other events for the youth all year long. For more information, check out tiff.net slash nextwave to make sure you don't miss a thing. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's special event, Max Manella's Teen Spirit. To begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. On behalf of TIFF, I would like to thank our lead sponsors, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. The Next Wave Committee is supported by the Slate Family Foundation Learning Fund and a shout out to TIFF Next Wave supporter, Chorus Entertainment. And of course, thank you to our members and our donors for their generous contribution to, to TIFF and those who support TIFF's learning programs year round. As film lovers and music fans, we are so excited to present a special screening of Max Mengele's directorial debut starring Elle Fanning. Yes, I'm also a huge fan of Elle Fanning. <laughs> The film features an explosive soundtrack with songs by pop stars Robin, Ariana Grande, as well as homegrown talent like The Grimms, Carly Rae Jepsen, and Tegan and Sarah. I personally love Teen Spirit because it's an absolute dream in a literal and metaphorical sense. The moments experienced in this film feel like fantasies that only exist in your mind until they don't. It's absolutely triumphant. A big thank you to Elevation Pictures for some for providing us with this film. It opens in theaters on April 19th. So just go watch it again and bring your friends too. We are pleased to have Tom Power moderating tonight's conversation with writer and director Max Minghella after our screening. Power is an award-winning musician and broadcaster best known as a host of Deep Roots and Radio 2 Morning on CBC Radio 2, and more recently as a host of the National Arts and Entertainment Program Q on CBC Radio 1. He does a lot of things. Please join me in welcoming Tom. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my God. Hi everybody, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Is everything all right? Uh, my name, she's right, my name is, she's right. My name is, uh, off to a good start. My name is Tom Power. I'm the host of Q on CBC Radio One. Any CBC fans in the audience or anything like that? Glad, uh, glad both of you showed up. Also, so happy to have the true sign of a true CBC fan. I asked that question, a bunch of people clap. One person in the back raised their hand. <laughs> Beautiful CBC radio listener move. Uh, yeah, so my name is Tom Power, not as you would have thought when I came out, uh, or as someone pointed out in the hallway on the way here, geez, Colin Hanks has let himself go. It didn't really happen. I made it up. It's, uh, that's okay. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be here. I, I got to see this film in the way that I think that the director always imagined, which is in my brightly lit office on a computer screen with headphones. But it is uh, an absolutely stunning film. And I, I just got to talk to Max a little bit about it um, because I think that, you know, no matter large or small, we can all find ourselves in situations that we need to overcome. We can all find ourselves in situations that seem like they're holding us back, and we all need to find the right people to help us overcome those odds, right? I mean, this film is, is a story of that, of overcoming adversity, of courage, of getting out of your shell, from escaping from the places that hold us back from our dreams, and again, the friendships that we make along the way that facilitate us becoming our true selves. And it, it's useful also that there's several deadly pop jams in this movie. So um, I know I don't, I don't want to talk much longer because I want to get to the film, and I also want you to introduce to the guy who made it. So uh, uh, would you please welcome, you might know him as Nick Blaine in the very successful TV series, The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. Saw the hand go up in the back again. Very Margaret Atwood, I'm into it. Uh, or from the films The Social Network, The Internship. This is his directorial debut, and what a debut it is. He also wrote the film, and uh, apparently a gigantic fan of the greatest pop jams of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our special guest, Max Minghella. Oh my God. Hi, everyone. Um, we, we won't keep you long, because we're going to come back and talk to you afterwards. Um, it's hard to know what to say before you watch it. Uh, Elle's really singing in the movie. No one believes me when I tell them that, but it's her voice. Um, we didn't have to mess with it. It's an incredible 
performance um, and an incredible vocal performance. So you can you can enjoy that as a piece of authentic something when you're watching it. Um, I'm somebody who who gets very excited to see a certain kind of film. I normally get excited to see robots um, killing each other and uh, superheroes flying around. And then when I go and see the movie, I'm often uh, disappointed, I would say, by the experience. And th- then the films I end up loving at the end of the year are the films I kind of get dragged to against my will, um, often with subtitles, and then I, I sort of love them. And uh, and this movie is really just an attempt to bridge the gap, I think, between those two things. So hopefully this was a movie that... Um, you weren't dreading to come and see, and uh, hopefully when you leave, you won't be mad at me. Um, so we'll, 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 come and, we'll come and talk to you afterwards. Thank you so much for coming out. We love you. Bye. Please welcome to the stage the filmmaker, Max Mangel, everybody. Wow. I agree. Wow, man. That's a, that's a beautiful film. Thanks, man. How are you holding up? I'm pretty sleepy, guys. I uh, I thought I lost my passport last night, and I spent uh, I was up till five in the morning trying to find it. I did find it. That's why I'm here. Um, but you I'm a little need- sleepy, so forgive me if I'm not very articulate. I'll make sure to keep it as uh, as low and quiet and warm as possible. So Bless we'll just Bless. we'll both just nap here a little bit. So before, actually, before we do anything, Cam McLaughlin, are you here? Where are you? This is the editor of the movie. Uh, he was a, a Canadian local and made me look much cleverer than I am. Thank you, Cam. Tell me about the um, the genesis of the idea for this film. I, I understand it was inspired by a song. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, some movies are inspired by books. This was inspired by music. I I I, uh, I heard that Robin song dancing on my own. And I think we all do this, right? When we listen to music, sometimes we, we imagine things in our heads. We picture our own little movies, uh, our little fantasies. And uh, I did the same thing. And I and I started to write to that piece of music. I thought it was a very interesting song because it's poppy and anthemic and uh, candy colored. And then underneath it is something very deeply melancholic and European. So I thought that was a very interesting contrast. Um, so I wrote the scene that you see in the film where Elle uh, performs for the first time. And um, it was obviously quite an odd sequence. We were playing with uh, character exposition in quite a strange way. Uh, the chronology jumps around a lot in that sequence. Um, so I knew it was going to be quite a stylized movie, uh, just based on that one scene alone. And uh, I wanted to make sure that we had something underneath it that was uh, and, and something that you guys could tether onto, which is sort of where the Cinderella idea came from. So it's a, that, that's sort of the, the genesis, I would say. But I, I want to go back to that to that song, Dancing on My Own, because you're right. It's, it, it's in some ways like allegorical to... Violet's life. In some ways, that song is about dancing. It's about, it's about being present. It's about, and it sounds. It sounds like something and looks like something that is such, so so wantable, so enviable. But when you actually listen to the chorus, and I know you and I spoke about this a little bit backstage, what she's saying is, "I'm outside of all of this. I'm in the corner. I'm over here." Well, what what is it about that duality within that song that inspired you to make this film? Well, I feel like that in life. I mean, we we talked about this. You you know. Y- you grew up on an island, no? I grew up in, in, in Newfoundland, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't grow up on an island, but I grew up in England and, um, you know, had a weird relationship to North America and, and felt very much like that was a culture I, I felt more comfortable in. And my parents are both immigrants. My mother's Chinese. She moved to England when she was 19 years old. She didn't speak a word of English to become a dancer. So there's a lot of my mother in Violet. Um, and then my father is the son of immigrants and grew up on the Isle of Wight. So there's a lot of my father and Violet too. Um, I think some of this mentality just kind of, I don't know, it just rubbed off on me even if it doesn't make sense. Your father grew up on the Isle of Wight? Yes. So just tell me about the decision then to set the film there. It's not entirely because of that. I mean, there's, there's the personal connection, which I like. But the main reason, honestly, is that I thought it was a good metaphor. I, I wanted... Uh, I like the idea of those geographic distance between Violet and her dream. Do you spend any time there? I've spent time there. I've got family there. And how is it? It's um, like you see it. It's very quaint. <laughs> I think you're going to be responsible for an uptick in tourism to the Isle of Wight. Are you? I hope so. They're going to get dozens of people. 
It was like Canadian humor. Sharp Canadian wit. Yeah, well known. We're well known for that here in Canada, yeah, for sure. Um, tell me about creating the character of Violet. Well, well uh, Elle has a lot to do with that. So um, this movie was originally 90% in Polish and was set in Poland um, until very close to, to production, actually. Uh, we just couldn't cast it. We couldn't find somebody who could speak two languages fluently and sing and dance and milk goats and you know, carry every frame of the film and play the age range. It was just one too many things. You could have asked me. I'm right here. I could you know, I, mean, I, know, I, know, I didn't know you at the time. Yeah, I know. But now um, you do for the sequel. <laughs> for, for Teen Spirit 2. Uh, so I... Um, yeah, it, we just couldn't find anyone. And, and we announced the movie about an actor and we were told that was a suicide mission. And then uh, Elle's team reached out to us and I was a huge Elle Fanning fan. I had no idea how she was going to play a Polish person. Um... I mean, genuinely, the whole film was in Polish. I was like, I don't understand how she's going to do this. And then we met up, and it was very clear within 10 minutes that not only was she going to play the part, she was probably the only person who could play the part. She'd done this dialect before brilliantly. She could sing better than anyone we'd met for the part yet. Um, she could dance effortlessly. Um, she wasn't scared of learning some Polish. I mean, obviously, we shifted the balance. Uh, but she was very excited to take that on. Um, and the most important thing to me by far was the overlap between Elle and Violet. <clears throat> there was a huge, uh, almost comical connection between the two of them. And uh, that was really exciting to me. And what happened after that was she became sort of an author of this character with me. So I had to go and rewrite this film to set it in the Isle of Wight and set it in England. And at the same time, I knew who was going to play this part. So I started to absorb a lot of the conversations we were having about what Elle was going through in her life and where she was in her life. Well, to tell me more about those connections. You said there were these almost sort of otherworldly connections between Elle, uh, the actor, the, the human, and, and Violet, her character. Also a human. Um, uh, somehow both an actor and a human at the same time, which truly <laughs> I, is a great I, I, would, I would be speaking out of turn. I mean, it's this is, these making movies is it, it's a strangely vulnerable thing. I think we all, anybody who's been on a film set, it's filled with people sort of having therapy sessions with each other <laughs> and telling each other their deepest, darkest secrets, and then they never see each other again, uh, much like Vlad and Violet, actually. Um, so I, you just get in confession time, and we did, there's a lot of uh, Violet became uh, uh, again an author of this character as much as I was, um, and that's good because I'm a 33 year old man, and it's helpful to have the insight of somebody who's actually that age um, and that gender. But one, one thing I, I can I guess speak about with getting too personal into these things is the way this film talks about fame, which I found really really fascinating. In in some ways, you have uh, Violet uh, who's on the way up, who's who's coasting to towards a fame, that you have Vlad who's coming down from a fame, all within the construct of a television show that is meant to create nothing but fame. Ooh, tell me a little bit about that. What did you want to say maybe about fame or portray about fame in this film? It's so interesting. I don't think I thought about fame at all. Um, and I don't think Violet thinks about it at all. Maybe that's why I don't think about it. Uh, I hope that the film is successful in one thing, which is that by the time she goes on stage at the end. Uh, I certainly don't think the character is invested in whether she wins or not. And I hope at that point the audience isn't really invested in whether she wins or not. That's not what this is about. It's a singing competition movie where the result is kind of irrelevant, actually. It's much more about is this person going to maintain who, her integrity um, in, a, in a circus where everything is trying to tug away at that. Um, and she doesn't always get it right, which is... I'm blabbering a bit, but I, it was so important to me that Violet was a fully dimensional um, articulation of a young woman. That often when I go and see films like this, the girl is wearing a lot of makeup all the time and she's smiling all the time and she laughs at everything the guy says and she falls for the right guy and she does the right thing or maybe she makes a silly mistake, but then she learns from it. And I don't, I'm not like that. I don't know anybody who's that perfect and pretty all the time. And uh, I thought it was very brave that Violet, uh, that Elle embraced this character of Violet. She doesn't wear any makeup in the movie unless it's kind of awkwardly clowned on. Um, she doesn't smile very much. She doesn't fall for the right boy and she doesn't make the right decision most of the time. Um, and yet she's the heroine of the story and I totally look up to her. And what she does at the end is sort of remarkable. So I think it's a very honest and fully uh, dimensional person and that's really a lot to do with her 
I, I, I think I, you're absolutely right. By the end of the film, I didn't care whether she won or not. And I think that says a lot about the way we perceive art. And I, th I think I should clarify what I mean by fame. Fame, uh, I mean, as the kind of the, the unintended result of people accepting the creation that you've made. So there you have someone who just really wants to sing, who this industry forms around them, and then propels them to this, whether they want it or not, level of superstardom that she is or isn't, she isn't ready for. And we see her struggle with that. We I, also would, I would argue that they're, 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 like, they're almost like mutually exclusive. I don't think she would have had any success had she not have had the integrity that she has. I mm. mean, and it's pure, I think, for her. She's a pure artist. She wants to express herself. She needs to kind of express herself. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it would, I don't think anyone would care about her in, unless that was the motivation. So then why, why frame it in, um, and I think it's incredibly effective, but why frame it in the context of a, of a singing show, a talent show then? Which, which is, um, I, I don't necessarily think so, but is often portrayed as antithetical to art, antithetical to creation, yeah. I think it's it's to do with a wanting to create like a, an opposite, like an antithesis to to Violet herself, which is interesting to me. But then it also came from something else, which is I was interested in making a musical movie, but I don't understand often why people are singing in musicals. Yeah, like out of nowhere during this, we just start going, going. Well, it's nice to be here, um, and it always I you know I don't I hate it all the time, but it sometimes I, it does it does confuse me, and so I was trying to figure <laughs> out how how do I do a musical where there's logic to why people sing um, and logic to them singing covers I, I knew I wanted it to be a movie with covers and not original songs because I'm somebody when I go to a concert I like to hear the classics and not not the new album um, <laughs> So it, 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 all of this is honestly selfish, Tom. You're going to ask me all these questions. The, the answer is every time I'm going to be because that's what I like. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're a greatest hits kind of dude. I'm a greatest hits for sure kind of dude. Well, then let's, let's talk more analytical and less about your own taste. Tell me about the relationship, um, portraying the relationship between Vlad and Violet. Tell me about creating that relationship. Uh, so the part was written for Zlatko Buric, who plays Vlad in the movie. Um, that was really one of the earliest seeds. I'd say the two first seeds were Dancing on My Own and the other one was Zlatko because I saw him and I thought he was remarkable. Um, and I thought it would be very interesting to build a film around that guy. Um, so I'm, I, I feel very clever now when I watch it, because not everyone was so convinced that this was going to work. And I think he's remarkable in the film. And I don't think anybody else could play that part. He is not lascivious in any way. You've got a movie of a much older man and a younger woman, and it could be a minefield and it's not what the film's about it was never what i was interested in exploring um it's about a, a complicated and beautiful very loving platonic relationship and what i think is interesting about it is they are drawn to each other for very selfish reasons um it's not because of any noble anything they they need something from each other um and then it turns into something that is completely human and beautiful and loving and there's a genuine connection but i think that's a bit of uh, a reflection of how I see the world, which is I don't think we, any of us, really do things out of kindness. Um, but then sometimes kindness can sort of emerge. I'm, I'm going to need you to elaborate on that. You yeah. don't necessarily think we do things out of kindness. I think kindness everything we emerge. do is a little bit selfish. It's hard for me to like pinpoint actions that we take without there being some kind of, even when you're charitable, is because, you know, it feels good. Um, there's a selfishness to it. But then I think these things can often turn into something real and really significant. Like humans are capable of a huge amount, I think, of love. It's an and statement, they say, rather than a but. Like you can, yes. you can, you can donate and uh, feel good about yourself for doing that and also know that you're, you're helping out. Yeah, that's true. But th that being said, in many ways, that parallel, and I guess I'm kind of hung up on this idea and I'm, I'm realizing that mm. I may be way off, but I'm a radio host, so my job is to overthink things good. that people just make. It's my job is to dance about architecture. <laughs> so I, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, quote, quote I, I, I can't help but think about the marriage of art and commerce. I mean, this is what I thought about the entire time I was watching this film. Here you have pure talent and the, and the expression of art and how it's framed by commerce. And when I hear you speak about, um, we don't do things selfish, uh, we don't do things altruistically, it's always with a level of, of selfishness. 
it's the same thing. We can create all the art that we want to, but there's going to be a part of us that's going to do something selfish. And two people who can do selfish things together can still make something beautiful. Yeah. So, so, so was the relationship of art and commerce on your mind at, at all in making this film? I think it's, it's, it's sort of always on my mind in, in life. And it's, a, it's something you do have to kind of think about, unfortunately, when you're making things. Uh, you, I think it's naive to not be conscious of, 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 of both sides of it. And I'm not somebody who judges that part of the world certainly in the film industry you know like there's lots of uh, I think directors who get mad at studios and they're like why do they want this and why do they want that it's terrifying they're spending gigantic amounts of money yeah, on yeah, things it's, it's an incredible you would amount want of the money. money back too yeah. you'd be nervous you'd be it's a risk um, so I, I, I'm sympathetic to, to all sides of it I'm not somebody who's like anti-commerce or anything like that so um, that being said so this is your directorial debut mm. congratulations thank you Tom. Um, I'm interested to know how making this film may, may have changed you? Uh, oh, a lot. A lot. Um, it's been a very humbling experience. I, I work with, there's so many people here who, uh, who actually made the film and aren't here, the real people who made this film. Um, two, two very significant people. One is Fred Berger, who's the producer of the movie. Um, he also produced La La Land and lots of other great films. And he, he produced the film alone. Um, and he signed onto it when it was still the Polish language <laughs> version of the movie. Uh, I can't believe he decided to support me. I was, I, this is going to sound sort of hyperbolic. I was uh, completely unemployed and sleeping on a friend's office couch while I was writing the script. Nobody had any interest in reading anything that I had to say. Um, I could not have been less sexy in this industry at that moment in time. And he was a very successful young producer who read something and saw something in it and believed in it and got paid negative money to make this film. So um, he's been remarkable. And also Jamie Bell, who's my best friend who I wrote this film with. And it's a movie about friendship. And uh, it, it, our friendship is one of the most significant things in my life. And I would say that both of them are incredibly unkind to me. Oh, good. A cam good, can good, back good, me good, up, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can back yeah, me up. Do not... we have that on the record? I want to read a transcript <laughs> to them tomorrow. <laughs> they're, not, they're not very nice to me, um, and that's been really good for me. What do you mean by that? It's just been good to work with, you know, two people for three years intensively who don't let you get carried away. They really keep you grounded. They... I've never gotten a pat on the back making this film from them. It's very nice when you guys say nice things, but it, 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 it's all through the lens of, of these kind of collaborators who I think have, have really kind of pushed this film and pushed me to make it as good as possible and not rest on my laurels. And um, that's been a hugely valuable experience. It's very, I think it's very easy to get carried away with yourself and, um, and they don't let that happen. Can you think of something you may have learned in the making of this film that you didn't know, rather than something very technical, but something you may have learned while making this film that maybe you didn't know going into it? Don't, well, well this is technical. Don't, don't write a film all in Polish. Don't write a film all in Polish. Don't write lots of dialogue scenes in a car at night. That was that was a big lesson for me. Well, I don't. What do you mean? Well, there's we fixed it while we were shooting the movie, but I'd written all these like a dumb first time writer. I'd written all these long dialogue scenes in a car at night, and I got halfway through the shoot and we started assembling the footage. And I looked at it, and I was like, oh god, it's like these scenes are, might as well take place in a broom closet. So I had to start. I had to start sort of reshooting um, lots of the movie while we were still in production, um, which was you know unnecessarily complicated. So I say next time. Think about location, location, location. It was nice to hear you talk about your, your, your partners in this film because, yeah, again, I, I want to point out what I said at the beginning, which I truly mean is that we can find ourselves in, in, in circumstances, whether it be um, someone uh, on the Isle of Wight who dreams of leaving, someone sleeping on their friend's couch while trying to write a film. And it's the relationships and the friendships that we make while altogether maybe not truly based fully on kindness, mm. but can can take us out of those situations. Completely. And and just to be clear, like I think they they can evolve into the most meaningful, special things we have on this planet. I mean, that's why we're all here, basically, is because of connection. Um, there's a very famous uh, sort of script doctor person called Lindsay Duran, and she says that uh, every great film is about two people, which I thought about a lot. It's always about a relationship between two people. Um, but I think that's because life is sort of ultimately about <laughs> relationships and that is our greatest fruit. Well, I'm, I want to open things up to any questions uh, people might have for Max. Um, I think there's some folks walking around with what I told were, were lightsabers. What do the lightsabers look yeah. like? 
What does that mean? Oh my god. It's a light dagger. Um, hi, I just wanted to say this is my second time seeing the oh, film. Oh, dude, thank you. Um, I saw it during festival. It was my favorite film of the festival. Thanks, so I mate. have to come back and see it again. Um, my question is about the relationship. Um, you were talking about relationships, how people sometimes they start for selfish reasons and they, you know, can become something quite real. What was my second time seeing it, what I saw was a young girl who, I mean, it's an obvious thing for everybody too, but for me, I saw this young girl who desperately needed a father figure and a father figure desperately needed a daughter. And obviously they part ways, um, thinking and caring about each other, regardless where they go. Was that something that you wanted to explore the relationship between parental figures and children? Was that something that you stumbled upon while writing it? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I really wanted to try and do it very differently. Like the trope of uh, specifically between fa with fathers for some reason in film is, is, a uh, is massive and prevalent and Spielberg's done it better than any of us can millions of times. Um, it's really why I sort of started with this kind of weird moment of young Violet witnessing her mother's adultery, which I felt was quite odd and specific and not biographical actually at all, but just something I thought would be an unusual starting place. And um, we all have very complicated relationships with our parents, unfortunately. Um, uh, but I think it's a big part of who she is. I mean, that I just walked in at the end of the movie and when they're fighting that hallway scene, she's so quick to push him away because she's terrified of him pushing her away first. And that rings true to me every time I see that scene. Um, uh, maybe right here. I didn't know I was doing the picking. That's cool. I never got to do that before. I know I feel all right. I so much I, power right now. Um, I've been a big fan of your acting since The Handmaid's Tale came out and a big fan of your directing since today. Um, my question is, I know you... <laughs> Canadian humor. Yeah, pretty I know good, you, pretty good. Yeah, you want a job? It's great. Yeah. You said that Al Fanning really was singing, and I feel like a movie like this, you'd have to have such a musical ear to direct. So my question is, do you sing? Oh, yeah, and I do, very badly, but I do I constantly, actually. It's my tick, it's my Tourette's, is that I'm always, always singing. Um, it drives people crazy. What's your go-to? Right, uh, well, I get earworms. I mean, I've been singing Taylor Swift Endgame for about, you know, 18 months, I think. Do I do it a little bit? Not really. Okay. I can spare you all. I'll spare you all. It'll just happen. It will just happen at some point in the next 20 minutes. I was, it was worth a shot. I can figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, so this gentleman right here, in the uh, also in the, in the second row there. Can we get a lightsaber over to him? Or was I supposed to go to you, lightsaber? <laughs> Oh, I'm losing my... Oh, we'll go up here while... Uh, uh, we'll wait for you. But we'll go up here to this lightsaber right here. Okay. Hi. I'm the chosen one. He's okay. singing already. It's great. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, song selection, both in terms of the, the songs you, you chose to use and maybe some that didn't make the cut. I could see that inter Interscope was involved and sometimes, you know, logistically over creative property. There can be some, some issues there. So if you could speak some more to that. Yeah, where am I looking? Uh, red hat. Oh, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm so blind. Um, uh, yeah, so every movie that happens is, is a miracle. Our miracle was the music. I knew nothing about copyright stuff. And I wrote all of the songs that you see in the movie Bar One into the script, thinking, oh, this is going to be great. We'll get, all these, we'll get all these songs. I didn't know that that was not something that happens. Um, there was a massive, massive coincidence, which is before Fred made La La Land, we'd asked him to produce this film. And he, he went off and made that film, which he was very self-deprecating about, and it ended up being quite successful. And Interscope, were, were, they did the soundtrack for that movie. They weren't producers, but they did the soundtrack for it. They liked him a lot. He's a very charismatic person. And they said, well, what else you got? And he said, well, I'm making this Polish musical. And uh, <laughs> they were like naive enough to say, great, we're going to get back in the film business um, because we want to. Um, they hadn't made a, a movie since 8 Mile. It's a long time. And they said, hey, we're going to do this weird Polish film, which was lovely of them. And... Um, and they happen to have this is this is insane. They happen to have about ninety percent of the catalog of what I'd written to the script by total co coincidence. If that hadn't happened, the movie would never have happened because all of the scenes were written to the songs, very specifically. Like the shots were prescribed to each verse and chorus, and it wasn't it wasn't something that could separate. 
Um, so it was just a miracle and it was felt very meant to be. The only song that we, we, we didn't find till the very end was Don't Kill My Vibe. We had a ballad in there, which is the last song she sings at the end of the show, the finals. Um, we had a ballad in there for a long time and it felt like the obvious thing to do and then we got rid of it because it was the obvious thing to do. And I couldn't, I couldn't find the song at all um, and I was, uh, couldn't sleep one night basically. Um, and it was like three o'clock in the morning and Don't Kill My Vibe came on the radio and I'd never heard it before. And I was feeling very defeated about this film and thought it was never gonna happen. And I was giving up hope and feeling crap about myself. And uh, <laughs> it felt very in tune with how I was feeling in that moment and also how I felt Violet was probably feeling at that point in the movie. You know, given that this um, this film, he said, is, is largely based or on a feeling you got when you listened to Dancing on My Own by Robin, uh, did you get a chance to talk to Robin about this? I, I haven't. She's seen the movie. I mean, we keep sort of hearing that people have seen the movie and they like it. The one person who's been a big champion in the film has been Katy Perry, who's been absolutely lovely and um, and I think genuinely r really does love the movie, which is nice. And one of the greatest pop singers of all time. Yeah, it's great. Uh, this gentleman right here, lightsaber up, my friend. Uh, hey, uh, I really loved the film. I Thanks was too. curious about the visual style of it because particularly in the singing competition scenes, the whole... I guess, neon drenched type thing with the backlights while she's singing. And I was curious how that came into play and where that idea was conceived from. Uh, was well, there's two, there's two things. So I've spent like the greater part of my twenties with, um, a camera and I'd shoot everything I did. So I'd go to like a birthday party, I'd shoot the birthday party. If I went to bar mitzvah, I'd shoot the bar mitzvah. If I went to a wedding, I'd shoot the wedding. And then I'd cut it into a little film. And I noticed by the 50th one of these films that they, basically were all the same. No matter what I was filming, they kind of ended up being told in a very similar way with a very similar style, using often music and visual language to tell the story, quite naturalistic in tone. There was like all these kind of consistent things. So when I was thinking about this movie, I was trying to sort of help myself a bit. I thought, okay, well, this is sort of how I tend to work. Um, and this is going to be scary. I'm going to be showing it to all these really clever people, the TIFF light box, and they're going to judge me. So um, help yourself and do the thing that maybe you're experienced with. So a part of thinking about the style and the visual style of the movie was trying to think about what I'm comfortable with. So that's um, how, why the camera does what it does. And then the light is all Autumn Dural, who's the DP, who's a genius. And I'm truly a genius and I think one of the, just the most tasteful um, people I've ever come across and she's really a genius with light and I know nothing about light at all It is an area of, of Technicality that I've just never wrapped my head around so I'm obsessed with where the camera is and what the camera is doing And she's obsessed with what the lights are doing and together we make a pretty good team that, That's the case. Hey when you were a kid you were when, when you were a kid you were filming everything in your life I mean, yeah, until, I mean, yeah, until my, I, I, when, I got, when I hit my 30s, I sort of stopped. <laughs> but until then, I was doing it really consistently. That's my sort of training, I would say. I mean, I, I think it goes without saying that your father was an incredible filmmaker. And it must have been incredibly meaningful to him to see his young son walking around with a camera filming things. I think my father and my mother were endlessly frustrated that I had no other interests. <laughs> I never I never got the, God, it's great that he loves playing with cameras. It was only, why won't you learn or be interested in anything else? <laughs> um, no, genuinely, I think it was a great disappointment to them. And I ended up going to college very late in a sort of sad, pathetic attempt to prove to them I could be academic. And that backfired instantly once uh, you know I had to write things. <laughs> Let's, uh, uh, anyone else for a question here? Where's the nearest uh, lightsaber there? All right, we're heading up there. Hi. Hey. Um, in a lot of ways, this film kind of feels like candy for millennials. Um, a lot of throwback, amazing references. Um, it ends on the same song that Mean Girls does, which takes me back to high school. <laughs> um, and obviously the vibes of Robin. Um, but now in 2019, we kind of are in a bit of a jaded age and we've all seen Black Mirror and we all know the grungy side of when we throw back to the 90s and so on. Is there meant to be a little bit of a dark side and a duplicitous side to the news that Angel X can't move on to the next round and Rebecca Hall finding the necklace? Or is that just me? trying to read too much negativity into something that should just be wonderful and unadulterated. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I, I, 
I think the movie is extremely melancholic and and uncomfortable. I mean, the the Jamie and I had a great time choosing the music for the club scene. Um, we settled on Barbie Girl because we thought it was the most disturbing piece of music we'd ever heard. Um, genuinely, we were trying to think what is the most disturbing piece of music you can think of, and we weren't laughing about it. We said Barbie Girl is really uncomfortable and horrible, um, and we weren't interested in trying to make something that's like purely saccharine. I think it's probably the most feel good movie I'll make, but I also think it's quite a uncomfortable movie often um and uh yeah i mean everything you're talking about i just don't think the world is is one color it's not always bright and it's not always dark and um i, I hope the film sort of shows that or was trying to show that it is interesting to me though that for someone who was raised in show business who has entered a career in show business and has now made a show film business. and it now has made a film about show business that you could make such a do, do you consider the film to be an uncynical film oh that's a really interesting question i think it's really cynical and really not cynical i mean i would say the stuff with violin vlad is not cynical at all it's in it's the most earnest part of me um completely it's just uh it's it's a love letter to some very key people in my life who have stood by me when they shouldn't um these are friends or or, or family or something friends like and family yeah let's say he's an amalgam vlad is an amalgamation of many real people in my life who are imperfect and who i would die without um so that's really meaningful to me then i would say yeah my i'm a pretty cynical person so i, th I would say that that sort of <laughs> probably seeps its way in to the film overall um, and it's certainly playing with archetypes. It's playing with cliches. It's playing with uh, what this movie's supposed to be, and then hopefully subverting that. Um, I love Rebecca's character. It's my fo my favorite character to write. Um, she's based on my agent, um, who's also uh, who's a guy um, and, and very mean to me also. But he's he just has this ability to always say the truth, but the truth is not always flattering. Um, and the truth is very powerful. What was important to me with Rebecca is that she, she doesn't say anything that's untrue in the movie, even though she's the Mephistopheles villain, Faustian, whatever. She's she's always honest. In fact, she's completely right what she says to her. You've already won. I don't. I would. I would sign. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to turn that down, eh? I understand what you mean when you say it's a subversion of something we were expecting, and we started our conversation by you mentioning that this was like Cinderella. So this is like a subversion of the Cinderella story of the fairy tale. I, I think so. I think it's like, yeah, let's take Cinderella and then what if they were actually real people? <laughs> yeah, with, with real emotions. With real and emotions then, yeah, and right. dimensions. That's sort of the idea, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I was, I'm also obsessed with High School Musical. Um, I love High School Musical earnestly, but it's sometimes a bit, not, sometimes not great. And so, <laughs> so, you're, so it was a bit of that too, of just like, oh, I love this. I'm very drawn to these things. It always sounds fun. If somebody's like, I want to put on High School Musical, it sounds like, that sounds great. That sounds like it's going to be an entertaining 90 minutes. But then it, some of it's not very real and you just kind of wish it was a bit, it was sort of a more grounded version of those kind of things, I think. We have a room for two questions left. Um, this gentleman right here has had his hand up with the, uh, over right behind you with the beard oh, there. Me? Oh, sorry. Uh, Hi, uh, I, I was just uh, wondering because originally it was planned to be a, a Polish movie. I'm, I'm wondering, well, what was uh, the specific reasoning for starting off in that? Yeah, it was um, me being stupid, but also just the Robin song. I mean, I just, it felt so European to me. And also because I knew I wanted Zlatko in the film. And he was Croatian, so the original was set in Croatia because I was just trying to get him. Um, it did. It, it, I, I hadn't really thought it through for, for honestly for thematic reasons. It was just I want this actor in the movie. This music feels very European, Eastern European to me. It would be weird if this took place in Texas. Th the English part of it <laughs> didn't occur to me until L. I never considered making the movie in England at all until she she suggested it. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, we could do that. There's also a lot of Polish people in England. I mean, there's very few English people in England, is the ironic thing about it. Um, we have one for one more question. Uh, uh, this uh, woman right here with the uh, raising her hand with the white shirt in the very front row with glasses on. Is that a white shirt? That's a Korean. That's a cream shirt. Cool. 
hi, I really like, oh, that's weird hearing myself. Um, hi, I really like the movie. I loved you in the mini project. I'm too scared to watch The Handmaid's Tale. Um, I wanted- They're very similar shows. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a sequel, if you think about it. Yeah, yeah maybe. Um, I was wondering why you chose to write this from the perspective of a teenage girl. I feel like you capture the voice really well, despite not being that. <laughs> um, and I just had like a, like, I feel like teenage girls aren't really represented very well in terms of like being taken seriously in movies. And I thought that this film really did a good job of that and just wanted to know your process. It, it's funny, it never occurs to me to write men really. And I don't know why, I'm just not very interested in them. I think it's because I am one, I know what I am. Um, so I think it's not for any kind of, I don't know, there's no higher reason. It's just taste. Um, Jamie and I were talking about something else the other day at a different project and he, he made fun of me. He was just like, I don't think it would ever, ever spring to your mind that the protagonist of a story could be a man. And I think it's true. And I hope that I'm allowed to keep making movies about women. I know that we're in a time where there's lots of discussion about this kind of thing, but I'm just, I don't need to watch another movie about, uh, you know, a white guy in his thirties navigating the world. Um, I don't, maybe somebody else does, but I don't. Um, and so it's tricky. People have given me a hard time about doing this, but I'm like, would you rather I've made a movie about a, a white guy in his thirties? Um, I don't care about that. Um, and I, and I'm glad you feel this way about this character. It's really, again, it's important to me that she is a dimensional person she's not a fantastical person um, and that she's still a hero um, those I, there's something about her that's like a superhero to me the way she dresses the costume the 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 writing on the hand and the three earrings and the shell suit it's like a it's like a it's like her costume to fly away um, it's been a real joy to be with you this evening which please give one loud round of applause thank, for you, thank you so much for staying for so long thank you very much my name's Tom thanks for coming out good night <laughs>